Harriet Shock. And before I get to the subject I chose, four often overlooked ingredients in a great song, I'd like to give you a brief summary of my basic songwriting philosophy. I believe great songwriting needs to have two key ingredients, and they are truth and craft. You need the craft to know how to write a song, something about song structure, rhyme schemes, melodies and harmonies or chords and rhythm. You need to be pretty proficient in all of these or you should collaborate with someone who is. That's the craft part. The truth part is that you will want to write something true. And by true, I don't mean factual. I mean some truth you pulled out of a situation you've either experienced or observed. David Wilcox says he writes from little realizations. However you get your truth, the truth needs to be there. A song that has craft but no truth is the kind of song that's a flash in the pan or something clever or cute. It may even get cut, but it won't be a copyright. And by copyright, I mean a song that will be covered and have a long life. And people's lives won't be changed because of a song that's merely cute or clever. Now a song with truth but no craft is like those songs you hear at open mic night where the person is really emoting about something extremely personal, but the craft is missing. That's when listeners think, I really didn't need to know that much about you. It can't be too personal if you have enough craft. Okay, now to the subject I chose, the four often overlooked ingredients for a great song. You notice I didn't say, the overlooked ingredients for a hit song. That's because nobody knows what they are, much less which ones are overlooked. Anyone who says he or she knows them is delusional. There's no formula or recipe for writing a hit song because so much of that is timing and chance. But I believe there's a particular ingredient that is included in every good song I've ever written anyway. It's often overlooked because it's not part of structure, it's not part of rhyme scheme or melody except indirectly, and it's not part of the chords. All of these ingredients are important, but there's one ingredient that you could consider a catalyst to all the others, making them work together in a way that they simply wouldn't without this hidden ingredient. And that ingredient is communication. Are you communicating to someone? Or are you simply bloviating, monologuing, telling the world what you think, telling the world what happened to you. Sometimes when you're really famous and everyone cares what you had for breakfast, it's okay to talk to the world about how you feel about things, but even famous folks are climbing a slippery slope unless they're communicating in their songs to somebody. The listener wants to identify either with the singer or the person he or she is singing to. So let's say you are communicating to someone. What is the most compelling way to do that? I think of songs as being little trials. You're in front of a jury and you're trying to prove your point. You're trying to be declared innocent or you're trying to prove someone else guilty, even if it's yourself in a confession. You just want your point to be made. How's the best way to do that? Well, with pictures. Exhibit A is the time he left you at the airport and forgot about your flight. Or exhibit B is the birthday cake she made by hand for a surprise party you didn't expect. Whatever the evidence, it should involve the senses. Either be visual, auditory, olfactory, tactile, or gustatory. In other words, something you can see, hear, smell, touch, or taste. You want to involve your listener. <clears throat> and you want to win your case. Of course, all of this about pictures and the senses applies to general songwriting. Songwriting for songs that singers will sing either on record or in concert. It doesn't always apply to songs for film and TV, which already have pictures. They have their pictures attached and you don't necessarily want conflicting pictures in the lyrics. 
But most of what I say here is about good old songwriting. Something that has a melody, something that has a lyric that is more than sounds that carry the melody along. If these songs that music supervisors are always saying they want in a film where there's raw emotion with no pictures to put behind the scene, if these songs were sung to an audience, people would be talking to each other rather than listening. In order to hold an audience's attention, you need to provide them with the pictures. Everybody wants to be at the movies, and if there is no movie, you have to provide it. I think sometimes when people start songwriting, they start by communicating what they want to say, but as soon as the initial burst of creativity subsides, they fall away into commun from communicating in English, and then they start songwriting and they don't speak the language of songwriting fluently. They haven't been writing long enough to say much more than the pen is on the table in the language of songwriting, and yet they want to discuss some profound observation about life. But if you remember you're still communicating, it might actually come out logical and clear rather than garbled, inverted, and other things that can happen when speaking a foreign language like songwriting. If you keep speaking English and communicating one thing to one person and do it with pictures and all the senses, the jury might just rule in your favor. Another point about communication is this. With so much emphasis on how things are said in songs, sometimes songwriters forget that what is said is actually more important. The ideas you put in your songs will either grab the listeners or alienate them. It's amazing how much a songwriter will actually reveal about herself or himself by the stance he or she takes in the song. It's not attractive in life or in songs to be a victim or to be sadistic unless someone, you know, you're writing a character in a musical. But I'm constantly amazed at some of the viewpoints songwriters have in their songs. Remember, the artist you're pitching to has to assume that viewpoint in order to sing it. And if you're the artist, the audience has to like you even though you have that viewpoint. Songs are small things. Yes, you're communicating to a person, but think of how complicated relationships are. You might be communicating to your mother and there are hundreds of songs you could write to her. I wrote a song for my mother that was put on a number of albums. I noticed in life that the buck stops with the oldest surviving mother in a family. I saw my sister's kids going to my sister and my sister going to my mother. So I chose the idea of who mother's mama. The chorus says, who feeds the chef? Who heals the doctor? Who mothers mama when she's scared of the rain? Etc. The question of who mothers mama inspired the song. For my father, there have been endless numbers of songs. But each one says one small thing, because songs are small things. But each one is specifically communicating to him and him alone. The same principle applies to writing love songs. You might have dozens of things you want to say to your loved one, but if you're writing a song, it's a good idea to choose one, not everything. And as I said, communicate one thing to one person and let the listeners be onlookers. Sometimes you want to communicate something very important to you and you want to tell the world about it. The hardest thing to write are songs that attempt to change people's minds. Even in those songs, if you can manage to be singing to a person rather than preaching to the listener, it'll be a whole lot more acceptable to the listener. If you're communicating something to change opinions, write to someone in the song who could learn from what you're saying, like a son or daughter, friend, niece, nephew, someone we can picture and let the advice come in rather than the listener being the recipient of the advice, which will make us feel preached to. Or you could do what I call the Archie Bunker School of Satire. Be the person you're revealing to the world as. 
you know, whatever negative quality you think he has, small-minded, prejudiced, ignorant, stupid. The persona singing the song is obviously these things, even though we know the songwriter isn't. Randy Newman is a master of this. Listen to rednecks and short people. As long as you're communicating, you might as well make it an intense communication. It's not polite social chit chat. It's art and art is usually intense. You have four minutes to say something so it had better get you to the height of emotion and fast. I was listening to Sam Smith's and James Napier's The Writings on the Wall and it typifies this kind of intensity I'm talking about. The melody is vitally important when it carries a message of passion and intensity. Granted, it was for a Bond film, but it can easily stand on its own. There's an urgency to the message and an intensity to the music. This is always good. Of course, there are songs that are about someone like Mr. Bojangles, Bad Bad Leroy Brown, Big Bad John. The character study song will follow the same principles of good songwriting. It's just not directed to a person. It's sung about the person. These songs are really nice in a set or on an album, but they're the seasoning rather than the main course. They happen much more rarely. Okay, so I've communicated enough about communication. Now for the second often overlooked ingredient, the rhythm of the melody. When it comes to the music, I like to divide it into melody, chords, and rhythm. Rhythm can be in the track and the melody. I think the most ignored part of all of this is the rhythm of the melody. If you study songs with just that in mind, it's very revealing. And today's top line writers have to understand this really well. A top line writer is someone who writes the melody and words on top of a track. In the old days, the person who wrote the melody and the lyric was called a songwriter. But now often the producer provides the track and of course he or she is involved in the writing credit. Often the top line writer is given a loop or a chord that pretty much doesn't change and over it they have to come up with really inventive melodies and different rhythms for, for the different sections even though often the chords don't change that much if at all. It's helpful to have variation between the sections, verse, chorus, bridge, etc., and make sure all of them have different rhythms of a melody. Let's remember that counting rhythm is not just one, two, three, four. It's one oanda, two oanda, three oanda, four oanda. For instance, Casey Musgrave's hits, Merry Go Round and Follow Your Arrow, both have verses that start on the O, or the and of one oanda. And then the choruses come in on the downbeat of one. It's pretty traditional for that to happen in the choruses and maybe that's because it works. The lyrics of Casey's songs are so good, sometimes people forget that how those lyrics lie over the track is extremely effective. Here's another example. If you can stop watching all of the action insanity of the video script for Blank Space by Taylor Swift long enough to study the rhythm of her melody, you'll see that she writes two lines of the verse, not on the downbeat, then goes to the downbeat for the rest until the chorus where she's off of it again. Harmonically, the verses are very similar to the chorus with one six minor, four five in the verse and one six minor, two minor and four in the chorus. What makes it so distinctly different is the rhythm of the melody in the verse, and it's different from the chorus, and the bridge is different still. People hear melodies like this, and they have all sorts of contemporary production and costumes and expensive cars getting keyed, and they forget that the rhythm, the melody, is one of the coolest things about it. And when she sings, you love the game, and here comes the downbeat, it really pays off. It wouldn't have if the whole song is started on the downbeat. Of course, rap is quite syncopated and rhythmically sophisticated, and I think it's had a good effect on pop melodies. Rhythm can be subtle, and some people 
don't get the subtle variations between a melody that was written with syncopation and an orchestral version that sometimes evens it all out. It sounds like it was quantized by the wrong person. But some just can't hear the difference. If you go to an open mic in a cabaret where people are doing covers, you'll hear them singing something that originally had syncopation, but their version does not. This will point out to you the difference. I've heard covers of my own songs that have had all the same notes and chords, but the singer's interpretation missed the subtleties of the rhythm of the melody. This happens sometimes when a choir sings a song or an orchestra plays one, but it doesn't have to. I used to have a friend who would tap out the rhythm of a well-known song on my arm and make me guess what it was. For instance, if you heard da 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 da, you might easily guess it's Jingle Bells. It might be more challenging and more fun though with Michael Jackson's Beat It. Okay, we've covered communication and the rhythm of the melody. The third often overlooked ingredient is finesse with exposition. Exposition is that stuff, sometimes backstory, you want the listener to know in order to understand your song. Before you write a line with information in it you want the listener to know, ask yourself, would I say this to the person I'm talking to or do they already know it? Here's an example of the wrong way to do it. You're writing a love song and you start, we met on a Saturday at the beach. That might be something you want the listener to know, but the person you're talking to already knows it. So it doesn't ring true that you would say that to him or her. We're watching you sing to your husband, for instance. You could say the sun was so bright at the beach the day we met, but you don't announce that you met at the beach. You see the difference? In a movie, if the screenwriter wants to establish that John and Mary are brother and sister, Mary doesn't turn to John and say, you're my brother. <laughs> she might turn to him and say, I'll never forget the day we cut a piece of mom's pie and squished it back together. This lets the audience know they're siblings. They have the same mother and they grew up together. In songwriting, you have very little time to establish the story. As I said, songs are small things. So rather than discuss the meaning of life or ponder what it is in your background that has made you such a wonderful person or a lonely one, it's best to choose one thing you wanna to say to one person on one subject. Okay, so we have the person you're singing to. Now let's say the plot of this song is you met this person as a child, and you've been friends ever since. You've weathered him through every storm, every terrible romance, every rejection. And the reason you've been there is you've actually been in love with him since childhood. You don't want to start by saying, I met you in the first grade. Unless this person has a terrible memory, he already knows this. You don't want to say, I sat and listened to you moaning about Catherine for three years, but you could say, have you ever wondered why I sat and listened to you moan about Catherine for three years? It's a subtle difference, but one is believable communication. And the other is announcing backstory to the listener. Even though I said it's helpful to communicate to a person in a song, because it helps the listener identify with you or the person you're singing to, there are story songs sung as if you were telling a story as a narrator. Bobby Gentry is a genius at the story song, having written Ode to Billy Joe and Fancy. Fancy has lots of exposition in it. It's all told brilliantly with pictures. Here are two short verses. She, the mother, she handed me a heart-shaped locket that said, to thine own self be true. And I shivered as I watched a roach crawl across the toe of my high heel shoe. It sounded like somebody else was talking, asking mama, what do I do? 
She said, just be nice to the gentlemen, Fancy. They'll be nice to you. In the hands of a less skillful writer, words like prostitute and poverty might have been used. But in this very, it's so much more clever without it. And this lyric is an example of great exposition. Talk about rhythm of the melody too. Listen to it sometime. I love Bobby Gentry's version, but there's also a wonderful cover by Reba McIntyre. The song is called simply Fancy. Okay, now we're at the final ingredient that's often overlooked. I like to call this one looking smart. It's actually quite easy to look smart as a songwriter if you use any available device that other writers have already discovered. By device, I just mean something cool another writer has done that you can learn from. These writers may be songwriters or they may be novelists, poets, or screenwriters, but they are doing something that makes you get the chills. Your job is to find out what that is and incorporate it into your own writing. Remember in English class when you studied metaphor personification and all those literary devices? Well, there are also songwriting devices. I had my students looking for these devices like you'd hunt for gold because they're very valuable. Sometimes the device can be so seductive, it's tempting to just use that and completely forget that you're communicating and using all your other important songwriting skills. <laughs> Once I introduced one of my students to a particular country convention of using an expression in the beginning of the chorus and then using it literally at the end, and that's all he wanted to do. Week after week, he'd bring in one more of these little twists. I discovered this device by hearing From Where I Stand, sung by Dobie Gray and written by Jennifer Kimball and Tom Schuyler. It goes, From Where I Stand, You Are the Break of Day. You are a silver thread, a starlight in the evening. I could hardly feel my heart before you held it in your hands and I hope you will never fall from where I stand. Which I always thought was, and I hope you're never far from where I stand. But either way, here's an expression at the first line of the chorus and a literal use of that expression at the end. From where I stand, from where I stand. Once I discovered this device by listening to other songs, I saw it happening more and more. And each time I had an emotional, response to it. I decided to use it in a song I was writing to someone whom I'd been trying to get through to, but he just wasn't getting it. <clears throat> so I chose the expression, for what it's worth. And the chorus goes, for what it's worth, I loved you and I love you. <clears throat> I might just show it best by moving on. For what it's worth, we had some precious moments which you might just remember once I'm gone. But I'd have given everything I own, gone anywhere on earth to get you to see my love for what it's worth. So the expression is in the first line and the actual meaning of those words is in the last line. It's not brain surgery, but it still makes the writer look clever. The funny thing is, I didn't realize I'd already used this device 10 years earlier in my third album's title song. You know, the one that was called, You Don't Know What You're In For, and I just didn't realize, well, I've already done this. Um, I never really got the device by putting it into words, so I needed to hear it in someone else's song for it to occur to me. But a decade earlier, I had written a chorus that went, you don't know what you're in for, love can be the prison as well as the crime, and you don't know what you're in for, but you still have to do your time. Because it wasn't in the beginning and end of the chorus, I didn't realize it's the same device, but it is. It's the use of an expression and then another interpretation of those words later. Here's another device I love. Putting two expressions together that have a common word. Hugh Prestwood wrote one of my favorite songs, The Song Remembers When, and he links two expressions in the line, that's just a lot of water underneath the bridge I burned. So water under the bridge and burn a bridge are the two different expressions which he linked in that one line. 
Does he look smart? You bet. But once you get inside the device and figure out what the writer did, it becomes yours and you can use it. Tom Waits uses the very same device in Bad Liver and Broken Heart when he says, and hey, what's your story? Well, I don't even care because I got my own double cross to bear. So the word these two expressions have in common is cross. See how easy it is once you know about it? For great writers like Hugh Presswood and Tom Waits, it just comes naturally. They were probably just thinking like the poet songwriters they are, but for others, it helps to know what causes the goosebumps. Well, that's all for often overlooked ingredients, in my opinion. Communication, the rhythm of the melody, exposition with finesse, and looking smart by using a writing device. Every single one of these ingredients will jump into your arsenal if you listen enough to other people's songs, and not as a fan only. Listen like a songwriter. Be a filmmaker at the movies or a seamstress at a fashion show. Find out how they did it and make a note of it. Then you can do it too. Thanks for listening.